presenter today is not only president and CEO of the Troy Chamber of Commerce, he's also a very talented musician, as we will soon see. He became a Presby Artist Fellow in 2012 and Artist in Residence in Farmington Hills in 2015. He's also produced a very fine documentary, which you can purchase for $20 today before you leave. Right there. Um, and he's here to share Armenian history and music with us. Please help me welcome Ara Tapuzian. Thank you. So can you guys hear me okay? That's always the most important part, right? That you guys can hear me. Well, it's, you know, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and, and I appreciate uh, Troy Historic Village having me here. And as Stephanie mentioned, I, I run the Chamber of Commerce by day and uh, play music by night or by day, as it seems. Um, and I'm gonna play some music for you, talk to you a little bit about Armenian music and you know, we'll answer some, some questions. Did everybody get a CD? Yes. Okay, my pleasure. If you don't like it, it doubles as a drink coaster. <laughs> so don't throw them away because it's got a multiple use to this. So I, I see some familiar faces in here, but by a show of hands, how many of you are Armenian that are in here? Yay. All right. So if I say something that's wrong, don't correct me in public. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of music, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this instrument that I'm playing today for you. Which, by the way, this is the perfect kind of venue to play this instrument. I don't need, you're going to hear it all the way in the back. It's got, it should have the perfect acoustics for today.
So I'm going to talk a little bit about this instrument. Uh, it is called a kanun. And there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, pronounce this or uh, even spell it. Um, we spell it a couple of different ways. We spell it K-A-N-O-N. -N, so uh, I try to, whenever possible, pronounce it kanon. Sometimes it slips and I just say kanun, which is okay as well, which would be K-A-N-U-N. Um, it is played throughout Armenia and the Middle East. And it is um, widely played. It's, uh, this instrument goes all the way back to the 5th century. So the piano that's in the corner, this is its big granddaddy. <laughs> okay? Think about it, too. If you've ever looked inside a grand piano, what do you see? Pretty much the same thing, right? All of the, the strings. Uh, the only difference is, you know, there's little hammers inside the, the piano when you're striking the keys and it's hitting the strings. I'm doing the same thing with these rings on my finger and uh, picks. Um, there are 76 strings on this instrument. It's a lot of fun to tune. Not really. <laughs> Not really. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's very interesting to tune, uh, especially in, it, really in all kinds of weather, but obviously humidity is, is not, a, not a friend to most string instruments, right? This one in particular. The strings itself rest on this bridge. See, I need a third hand when I do these things, because it's sometimes hard for me to describe and point and do all that, so pardon me as I take, let me just take these off real quick. Okay, this is a little easier. All right. So you can see there's a bridge here, okay? So the strings rest on this bridge. The bridge itself sits on a skin. So back when this instrument was made, not this particular one, but certainly the, you know, going back several centuries, the skin would be an animal skin. So no animals were hurt in making of this instrument. <clears throat> It's all a synthetic skin at this point. Uh, and there's a good reason why, too. These skins are very fragile and can break. There is approximately about 10,000 pounds of pressure on, this, on the skins from this bridge, from the strings, okay? 76 strings on top of a bridge pulling down on this kind of skin makes it uh, you know, very tough. It's a very tough skin. But inside the instrument itself, it's pretty hollow. Same thing here. So there are little chambers within uh, the kanun, the box, if you will, and certainly the, the, the sound travels throughout, and, and um, having the skin on here is very important, and the, the bridge resting on it, the, the resonation that it has. And you can tell, right, when you heard this, this is a great kind of room to really play this instrument because you really hear the, the genuine sound of, of this actual instrument. Probably the most important part on this though are these levers. So obviously these are my tuning pegs, but underneath them you'll see a series of levers on the actual instrument. And those levers help change my notes. So when we're playing Armenian in Middle Eastern music, we're not playing a, a, a normal westernized scale like you would hear classical music or, or pop music, right? We're playing different, uh, different scales that we call makams. That's the Middle Eastern word for it. And so we don't, when we're sitting playing with other musicians, we're not necessarily yelling out you know, keys like uh, A major, D minor, we're not necessarily doing that. We're calling scales by their Middle Eastern names because to us, it gives, the easiest way to put it is it, it, it really tells the complete story of, of what we're doing within the song. So it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, I don't need to know the name of the song that we're gonna play. I need to know the makam the mode of which we're playing the music. There are hundreds of different modes uh, that we use to play. Uh, 
the, to play music. We probably, as we're doing Armenian music, and a lot of what we're doing is dance music, um, there's probably you know a couple of dozen different modes that we, we actually do. But let me give you an example of these kinds of levers. So when the instrument was first produced, it didn't have these levers on here at all. So the musician had to use his, his or her thumb on it, um, and I'm so glad the instrument evolved because <laughs> it would make it very difficult. The word kanon um, actually is, the, the, there is a, um, how do I word this? The Turks have the word kanon, and, and that translation means law. And so how we've kind of uh, translated that into this is this instrument is a very exact science kind of an instrument. And I mean that by, you know, when you're playing a violin or an instrument that doesn't have any frets to it, it's up to the musician to have the fingering in a certain place, right? With this actual instrument, it is exact based on all of these levers that I'm, I'm going to demonstrate to you. So it's sort of uh, appropriate that that name translated in English is, is law. Um, so for example, I'm going to play the note uh, C. Okay, that's just a normal everyday C that you see in the streets and in the movies. And then this is C sharp. You can tell the difference. On this instrument, I'm gonna, and then this is a C flat. Now on this particular, let's see, 9, 12, 13. There are 13 levers just on this particular C note, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with C flat, and I'm gonna work my way all the way up. And you're gonna hear the subtle differences. But if you can picture, and by the way, when we're done, you're more than welcome to come up and, and look at the instrument and, and ask any kind of additional questions. We'll have time for that as well. But these levers, if you could kind of visualize each lever when lifted up, raises the string just a little bit. And as we're playing Middle Eastern music, we're bending notes. So nothing in our music is as simple as it's flat, natural, sharp. They're what we call semitones. So we're taking a note between, so in this instance, the key is C. We're taking C between C natural and C sharp. By the way, there's no quiz later. So <laughs> if I start losing, you don't get too concerned. We're taking that note that's kind of in between that note to play it. And I'm, I'll demonstrate it, it'll make hopefully a little bit more sense. But again, this is, this is C flat. And I'm slowly lifting these levers up. If I do this for an hour, you'll be hypnotic and you'll want to leave all of your money on the pews. <laughs> no, you're not buying it. So could you hear that subtle difference again? So this is, and the difference from where I started was, so if we're playing, you know, again, this was C, just a normal C. If we're bending those notes ever so slightly, we might do something like this. May mean nothing to you, but it's a very slight difference. And when we're playing Middle Eastern music and we're playing in these makams that I talked about, it requires us to be able to bend some of those notes. That, that's what gives the unique sound. You know, if I'm going to play, you know, a, a scale that's just a normal, that sounds fun. That's kind of boring, right? If we're going to play it, you know, in Armenian style. be nice if I did that right. Big difference, right? You're looking for the genie bottle and something to come out of it. Another thing that's very popular within Middle Eastern music is called a taksim. 
and that is spelled a lot of different ways as well. As you can see, there's no, there's no real tried and true uh, way of spelling a lot of this stuff. But a toxime is a um, is shows the musician's ability to play their instrument. Usually at the beginning of a song, sometimes in the middle of a song, a solo, right? In the middle of a song is, is a toxime or a toxime, depending on how you want to word it. And again, it shows the musician's ability to play that, that actual instrument. So let me give you a little bit of an example. And those of you, do you like jazz music? Most of you probably like jazz music, right? Okay, there is a direct connection between the music that I play and jazz music. So I have sat in different jazz groups. I've talked to different jazz musicians. They get it. They can hear it. They can hear the progression of where the notes are going to go. They even get the rhythms and, and, and the different scales with it. So there is a direct connection to it. But a, a toxime at the beginning of a song could be something like this.
Thank you. <clears throat> so the beginning part of that song was actually sort of this toxin, this improvisation to be able to, to, to really play within, these, um, within the scale. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the origin of, of a lot of this music. So Armenian music uh, we'll talk of. Um, these songs that we play predominantly are village songs. Traditional uh, tunes that um, were never written down, okay? The, they change depending on which village you know you were from. There's different songs from those different villages. The songs, um, you know, we're not talking um, Shakespearean poetry uh, for, for a lot of this music because they're very simple, very simplistic songs, but they had their purpose. So the translating of a lot of some of these, I shouldn't say a lot, some of the, these songs could be as simple as, I saw the girl in the neighborhood, she's got black hair, I think she's pretty, I like her, she doesn't like me, she won't talk to me, but I talk to her, and, you know. I mean, when you translate this, it doesn't necessarily mean a whole heck of a lot, but when it's sung in Armenian, for someone like me, it's very pretty. It's, it's beautiful music. And, um, What's very interesting and what's very important to tell uh, because of this music, all of our songs had lyrics at one point or another. Now, I don't sing, you should all be really happy that I don't <laughs> sing or pretend to sing. <laughs> you would never look or talk to me again if you saw that I sing, right? Um, so they all had lyrics to it and some of it we know and some of it we don't. And why is it that we don't? And it's because of the Armenian Genocide. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Armenian Genocide, over 100 years ago, the Turkish government attempted to annihilate every single Armenian. So the Armenians, for the most part, lived within the interior of Turkey in different villages. What they succeeded to do was to murder a million and a half Armenians. So all of you that, you know, put your hands up, and myself included, we all are affected by the Armenian Genocide. Yeah. They can tell you stories. They've got a relative that they know of, uh, or a parent even, uh, and they, they, can, they can share those kinds of horrible stories. Mine, in particular, uh, was my uh, grandmother on my father's side escaped the genocide with her brother. Uh, they were orphans and, and they ended up in, in France. Um, I, they made their way to the United States like a, lot, like a lot of people did. And I ended up here because my mother was born here. My father lived in upstate New York and married my mother and came to Detroit. And that's why I'm here. Um, but what is v very profound, I think, about the music that we play is think about those that escaped for one second, okay? Some of them musicians, some of them not. My grandmother knew a ton of different Armenian folk songs, a lot of children's songs, and I've got those on a uh, videotape, believe it or not, of her singing some of the songs that she knew as a child. But there was nothing written down. There was no tape recorders. There were no record players. And I just find it absolutely amazing that these survivors were able to take what was inside their head. I mean, really, the stories you've all heard is what did they take with them? They took the clothes on their back, maybe a couple of belongings, but everything else was left behind. But the music didn't get left behind. They brought it. They escaped with it. I, I find that utterly amazing uh, and very thankful that it survived over 100 years. Um, just by memory. So you talk about musicians that are older than myself and they will tell you, you know, when, you, when, when folks ask me, well, how did you learn? Well, I learned by watching other musicians. I learned by um, playing records. Uh, last week I spoke to a group of fifth graders and I had to go, records, they, have a, they had a needle. 
it turned around. Three kids looked at me and went, I don't know what you're talking about, old man. <clears throat> I felt real good about myself. <laughs> so, um, but that's how I learned. I learned listening to records over and over again. I listened by recording these musicians live and then playing them back and then practicing. And then, you know, that's how I learned. How did they learn? They learned from other musicians or other people that just happened to know the songs. So I know one musician in particular that learned from another musician that was too old to play anymore, and they would sit next to each other in a room, and the elder would hum or whistle the song to the youngster, and then the youngster had to learn it, go run home. I mean, he had to keep replaying it in his head and his head, go home and practice it and practice it until he committed it to memory. That's absolutely amazing. And that music survived all these years. What's the downside of it? The downside is we lost a lot too. What about all the music we don't know that we'll never know, unfortunately? And as um, this same musician had told me, when 1915 happened, our music stopped. We didn't have anything more. What we had is what they left us. There was no more. So nothing got created after that. Sure, there's Armenian music today and, and so forth, but it's not, it's not the village music that your, your parents, grandparents, my, my parents, grandparents grew up listening to. It's, it's newer music. So that's kind of, I, I always make it a point to really talk about that because I really think it's important. I think when I was younger, we, we took a lot of this stuff for granted because again, we did hear it. And it's really important not to take it for granted. This music is not um, widely, wildly popular. It's not something you're going to hear on the radio. That's really the other reason I pass those CDs out too. It's because if you've got children, grandchildren, whatnot, so, and there's more, by the way. If there's extra and you, you know, there's some extra left, please take some to pass out. Because that's the only way folks will be able to, to sort of understand that. Okay. You getting tired of hearing me talk or no? No, not? Well, you're a stark difference from the fifth graders. <laughs> they just, half of them were like this. They were falling asleep. They're going, just play. So play, gypsy, play, right? I'll make one more point, then I will play a little bit more for you. And I, and I sort of made the joke by calling myself a gypsy. Not very untrue, okay? And I'll tell you why. The music that Armenians are able to play, we are able to play Armenian, we, we play Greek, we could play Jewish, we could play Arabic, we could play Turkish, we could play Persian, Balkan, Macedonian, you name it, we can play it. If you had an Arabic musician stand here playing the same instrument, which a lot of them do, the likelihood of them knowing anything but Arabic music, that's, good, that's gonna be about all that they know. Because that's, and that's not a knock at all. It's just that's what they learned. And that's what they perpetuate. And the Greeks, kind of the same thing too. They know Greek music, they know it in and out. Ask them to play Armenian music, there wasn't that call for it. For whatever reason, we have the ability to play in, in the interest to play a lot of forms of music. I personally think, and I don't know this to be 100% true, but it really comes from the fact that um, when the music got to this country and there were a ton of nightclubs and places to hear live music, right? Uh, in Detroit, it was the Stockade. It was, uh, oh gosh, there's probably about a half a dozen other places that in, in Detroit where, where there was music being played. Everybody wanted to hear different music. They wanted to dance Greek dance music. So who played it? The Armenians played dance music, Greek dance music. So when I call myself a gypsy in that respect, it's not, it's not too far off the map. Now, any of you that I see in my role as a chamber member calling me a gypsy is gonna have a problem later. <laughs> Okay. I 
I talked a little bit about um, scales and I talked a little bit about rhythms. I really didn't go much into the rhythms, but Armenian music has, you know, when you think of westernized music, you think of like a 4-4 rhythm or a 2-4 rhythm, which is very popular in, in normal music. When we're playing Middle Eastern and especially Armenian music, we're using a lot of odd time signatures. So uh, a lot of our dance music, so we do Armenian line dancing, is done in what is called a 10-8, so, uh, or, or a 2-4, or a 6-8, or, or, or a 9-8, for example. A 9-8 uh, sounds like, you know, 1-2, one, 1-2, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. So for the Armenians that are sitting here, it's a tamzara, we call it, okay? And I think I'm, I'll, I'll do a little bit of that for you to give you an idea of the rhythms. Okay, cool. So this is the fun part. You're gonna ask me all these wonderful questions and I'm gonna make up, I mean, I'm gonna give you some really, hopefully some nice answers. Yes, ma'am. When you said they had lyrics, do all of the songs you just played have lyrics that you start like this thing in the song or one like Sunshine or something like that? Do all those songs have words that go 
At one point, they all did. They all did. So uh, I would say, um, as I'm trying to think of what I actually played during this whole time, probably, probably a quarter of it I played um, was more instrumental. It's difficult to do these things solo and play an actual song that's got lyrics to it without it sounding very, very repetitive. I mean, obviously, think about if you were hearing someone sing this, there's maybe three or four different verses of it. And so I've got friends that call them the never-ending songs. And that's <laughs> sometimes what it, could, what it could actually sound like. It, But at one point, they, they all had music okay. or lyrics. Just related to that, I'm, I'm sure you're going to say to me, you're not a dancer. But what right. <laughs> How'd you guess? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You, you made you want to get up and dance. Yeah. And dance. Well, so every village had their own special dance, um, which is, by the way, another issue we have with all of this music is that um, the younger generation is not necessarily learning the dances, the actual dances. So I can remember watching, uh, you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents dancing their specific, you know, specific village dance. And they're, they're, we're going to lose them because no one's doing them. Um, every village had a different dance. Um, it's hard to sort of describe it without doing the actual dance. And no, there's no way you're going to get me to do that. But there's a lot of, yeah, no, no, no popular opinion won't work here either. But there's a lot, you know, most of it's, it's all line dancing. And so um, to do it properly, to do Armenian dancing properly, there should be one line, only one line. Nowadays, you'll see, you know, four or five people here, two people here, or whatever, or or doing some solo dancing, which is not really the origin of of the style of what we did. It would be one big line. There would be a leader in that line, um, and there would also be the person that would make sure the line doesn't break up and would also make sure that if you weren't a great dancer, you got at the back of the line or you didn't get in the line at all. It was that strict, right? Am I right? So this is my historical section who's gonna correct me to make sure I'm, I'm accurate with that. Um, I was gonna say something else and I can't remember now what it was that I was gonna say about it, but the, the actual, oh, I know what I was gonna tell you, is that at certain, um, Armenian dances, the musicians may see, you know, Mr. So-and-so coming in, and they know he's from the village of Kharpert, and that, that conjures up three or four different dances that we know he likes. Or, you know, Mrs. So-and-so came from Vaughn, and there are specific songs there. We, we don't do that as much anymore, but it used to be um, that songs were done by request. And they were done by specifically the villages. And I think a lot of that is, um, certainly it was that generation after the genocide, and it was probably a lot more familiar, you know, back then. I, did that sort of answer it a bit? Okay. Yes. Yeah, when I close my eyes and I hear this music, I can hear the Greek come through. Yeah. I, I could hear, of course, the Middle Eastern come through. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. I live in Egypt. Right. I, when you're playing it, I'm picturing the belly dancers. I'm picturing them dancing. Right. Yeah. And my other question was, I don't do that either. I don't <laughs> belly dance. <laughs> Nobody here wants to see that. <laughs> I, I don't, I, Trust me. But, Just, um, you're in good company. What is this instrument that you're playing? This particular one? This one is um, probably about 30 years old. Oh, I thought it was going to be a whole lot older. No, yeah. no. Um, <clears throat> No, no, it's not going to die with me. Um, there are still, there are musicians, uh, and there's younger musicians that are playing this music. Uh, is there a lot of them? No. Uh, in, in Michigan, as far as a professional kanun player, I'm one of two. And the other person is Palestinian. So, and he's, a, he's an excellent musician. I mean, you know, his primary instrument, that's what we, what we play. Um, t 
to answer your question, there is a great similarity between cultures. And uh, I'm sure in uh, a little bit of the style that I'm playing, some of that you know, is, is kind of shining through. So I don't just play Armenian music. I obviously play quite a bit, you know, an array of different. Any American music? No. 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 Just ask. Yep. I don't. No, no, no. Yes. What kind of accompaniment do you have? Do you have like percussion? Yeah. So I'd have, so when I, when I normally play for the most part, um, and I'm doing concerts and whatnot, it may be a, a trio or a quartet. And there's a drummer, a Middle Eastern drums. Uh, an oud player, if you're familiar with an oud, is a, um, a lute-shaped, pear-shaped, um, it's a lute. So again, the, the oud is the granddaddy of, of the lute. It's got 11 strings to it and played that way. Um, sometimes a clarinet player, if we're doing a wedding or a dance or something like that. Uh, the guitar came into the picture in the 60s when rock and roll was invented. So, um, because a lot of this music, it was, there was no guitar, you know, back, back when. So, uh, typically when I'm playing, I'm usually having a percussionist and a uh, guitar player at a minimum. Yeah. Yes? Do you only use two fingers? I do. I only need two. I only need two. So, when, um, there are musicians that play with all their fingers. I have a day job. There's no way that I'm going to, unfortunately, learn and to be, you know, of that skill. But there are some that play with all their fingers, you know, different sort of uh, ornamentations. And, but primarily, most uh, kanu players are, they've got a ring and, and, and a pick, and that's what they use. Yes? Yes and no. So um, I, I'm sure somebody has written it down. The problem with writing it down, for the most part, the music is not written down. It's recorded, and so it's preserved that way. The problem with writing this music, you lose the feel of that. It's not classical music. You know, if you're going to play Chopin, there's only one way to play Chopin. There's no deviation from it. If you're playing Armenian music, there is, there is an artistic influence that's sort of involved in it. It's got to be in your heart to want to play it. And so it's hard to put that on paper. Um, when I've played with non-Armenian musicians that love the music, and there are a lot that love it, they listen to recordings, and then they play it just like the recording, and it could be something I recorded, and if I don't play it like that, they get mad and say, that's not how you recorded that. Well, there's artistic license that one should be able to have with us. So it's hard to say it should be written, you know, it should be preserved. I don't know that it necessarily would benefit, benefit us if it was written down. If that makes sense. So then how did you learn? By, by, by hearing it? Yeah, by, I watched other musicians older than me that were on stage uh, playing either at a wedding or at a dance or whatever. Um, and then I listened to music. So I, I learned by ear. I can read music, not great, but I don't do any of that. If I'm learning a song for somebody else, I'm just playing it repetitively in my head, you know, through a CD or something like that. Yes? How long have you been playing that instrument? Uh, I've been playing for, I think, around 25 years. Yeah. I know I don't look it, right? <laughs> what you're supposed to say. Yes. Yes. There are, there are, um, th this particular instrument is not Armenian. 
This particular instrument was made in Turkey. Uh, the, the instrument maker that made this passed away a couple of years ago, but it was very well known as far as an instrument maker. There are Armenian kanun makers um, in Armenia today. Unfortunately, part of the problem is not having access to good materials, good wood, and so forth. So the, the instruments, even though they're trapezoid in shape and they have a lot of the same similarities, there's a quality difference. There are a lot of instrument makers overseas. Egyptian, uh, Syrian, um, Lebanese, Turkish, Armenian, Greek. There's a lot of different people that, that make them. So that's good, they're, they're, still being, they're still being made. So if you wanted a really good quality Armenian instrument, you could get it. You could, but it's not gonna be easy. It's, it's, so this is different than like a guitar, right? You know that, well, there's, there's one similarity. You know, you can look at a guitar, and I'm not a guitar player, so I don't know names, but if you were to take a brand name guitar and you saw it, you, and you know that that's a good brand name, the likelihood that it's a good instrument is pretty spot on. Same thing with, you know, Middle Eastern instruments. The, the problem is not every instrument is alike. And so you literally have to go and play it. So the problem with these instruments is that this is not something you buy on Amazon or something that's at the corner store. It's the, the, the instrument maker could be overseas. And I know musicians that have traveled to go try an instrument, not like it and come back. I'm not that rich. I'm not doing that. My instruments predominantly have come from other musicians that are looking to sell their instrument because they've got a, a new toy. So fortunately, including this one, uh, this came from a phenomenal musician friend of mine that played this instrument for years. I knew the quality was good. I knew the maker was good, and, and there we go. A few years back, my father, my father used to go to Armenia about twice a year, and I do have uh, an Armenian kanun. Um, it's actually from the Karabakh region, and it, to me it looks beautiful because it's Armenian. It's not easy to play, it's not well made, but it's gorgeous. It's got a, the face on it is of an Armenian church. I mean, it's all handmade and you know, you can't, but is that something I'm gonna bring out to play? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, sure, if you want to. <laughs> <coughs> See, that's such a hard answer. To, to, so, it, as an Armenian, I'd like to say, yes, you're exactly right. But that's the thing, is that there, there are Turkish kanuns, there are Armenian kanuns. Who, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yes, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Yes. A lot more expensive. <laughs> um, same family. Uh, dulcimer is usually hammered, hammered dulcimer. Or there's a Persian instrument called the santur, which is really similar to the hammered dulcimer. Same kind of class of family. Um, I'm not sure how many strings on a, on a, on a dulcimer, uh, but very similar. Our friends used to play it and make them. Yeah, they're very nice. They're very beautiful instruments, but a little bit, little bit different. Yes. I'm just curious because I'm not really familiar with the Armenian culture. Do they, do you have like a, is there like an Armenian festival in Detroit? No. There's, um, not like it used to be, but, but there are still Armenian events. It's, uh, the Armenian community is probably around 40,000 Armenians in the, in the metro area. There are, what do we have, four churches, three churches, four churches in the area. Um, there is an Armenian festival they do in the summertime. Uh, there are church picnics, that kind of thing. You know, it's not what it used to be, 
When I was growing up, there were picnics almost every weekend and live music and yeah, so it's changed, but it's a vibrant Armenian community. Yeah. Next weekend? The bazaar, you mean the, the bazaar. So churches have bazaars where you can hear music too. So yeah, that's right. Next weekend there's a, a church bazaar. Yep. Yes, sir. Oh, very good. I get that. I wish I had a nickel every time. I'd be a loaded guy. So this is not made for a left-handed person. I'm a lefty. So I have to play a little bit differently because I can't do this. The, the, the proper way, as some would tell you, would be that your right hand plays the melody and the left hand has the ability to change these notes as you're playing the melody. I can't. I'm left-handed, so I screwed the whole thing up. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's one thing, and, and if there's some more questions, but I, and I'm not doing this to be a carnival barker to, to sell stuff, but I do want to talk about this just for a minute. And this is a DVD that uh, I produced a couple of years ago that aired on PBS uh, during the, um, uh, the 100th anniversary of the, of the Armenian Genocide. And this is called Guardians of Music. And the reason I talk about it, uh, it's really sort of part of the, you know, the mantra that I do as I'm talking about a lot of this music is the musicians that played this music. So you've heard I run the Chamber of Commerce here in Troy. I don't do this full time. I consider myself, this is a, a professional hobby to a certain extent. I don't make my bread and butter playing the kanon. If I did, I'd be on the street somewhere, you know, holding a can. Um, but this documentary um, pays tribute to all of the musicians, mainly those that um, are either survivors of the genocide or, or children of the genocide. And these were musicians that worked during the day, probably a lot harder than I do, and, and a lot of people do these days. Um, they'd work their 12, 14 hour day, they'd go home, they'd have dinner, they'd shower, they'd change, and then they'd grab their instrument and they'd, off they go to either a nightclub or a dance or whatever it is. And they did it because they enjoyed the music. They didn't do it because they were making money. Some of these, these musicians never made money doing it, but they loved it. So think about, they're getting up at five o'clock in the morning, they're working until five o'clock at night, they go home, they change, and then they don't get home until two o'clock in the morning, and again, they get their three hours of sleep, and they kind of keep doing it. So this documentary focuses on, on those musicians um, and really their experiences with it. I mean, we had a, an Armenian band here that um, had an offer to go on the Ed Sullivan program. They didn't because they argued about the money, but that's besides the point. They were, they were asked to go on. They, they had taken an old um, Middle Eastern song and made it very popular. It was played all around and uh, the, the folks from the Ed Sullivan Show called them up and wanted them to come out. I mean, th nobody knows these stories anymore. So this, this DVD is, um, uh, is a little bit less than an hour worth of interviews, um, rare photos, which was a lot of fun to, to put together. I had a grant uh, a few years ago from the Knight Foundation that helped me put this together and then we just, we aired it on, on PBS. So I bring it up because I do get people that ask about it and, and I, I only have a million of them in my house that I need to get rid of. So, it's very good. thank you, thank you, PBS. thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll, I'll think. Yes. Is that right? Armenian culture dying out now? No. No, it's not. It's not dying out. What did someone say? We are? Is that what you just said? <laughs> oh, that's not true. <laughs> no, it's not dying out at all. So your kids are interested in this music and everything like that? My kids uh, are six and eight. They're interested in anything that I play to them in the car because they can't get out. So they do. They like the music. I mean, they, they listen to it. They ask for me to play certain things. 
you know, if they play it one day, great. I, I just want them to be exposed to it and to, to listen to it. If, I can't ask for anything more than that. But it's not dying. I don't want to give the picture that it's dying. The music, the, the music that I play is in jeopardy of going away. The culture itself, the Armenian culture is not going away. No. And the sacred music is still. And sacred, right. Church music is very, it's still very popular. Yep. Yes. Well, and, and that's why I tried to explain it. Sometimes hard, I'm not explaining it clearly. When I say the, the music stopped, all of that village music up until that point, that's all we got. If we didn't have a genocide, what else would we have gotten from it? How many more songs would we have had? Would we have saved the lyrics for all of these songs? Sure, there are Armenian musicians that compose music, but this is village music. This is not, you know, it's not something that can necessarily be created. It's almost artificial in a way, which is not bad. There's a lot of good music, but I'm, I'm talking about the actual village, uh, a lot of the village songs. Yes? I know, it's interesting. Uh, you said this, if you listen to this, it has the same beat as jazz. And so I'm listening to, you know, I don't hear Ari Jamal in this. I don't, I don't hear um, my other favorite. Right. Right. There's a lot of improvisation in the music. Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. So Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck is a perfect example of a jazz musician that lived in New York that went to Greenwich Village to seek out Armenian musicians, learn music that way. Herbie Mann, if we remember Herbie Mann, did two recordings that included uh, three or four different Armenian musicians on there because they, they heard it, they got it, they, they understood it. Yeah, that's what I meant by that. All right, I think you get, you get the last one. So you gotta, it better be good. No pressure, it's gotta be real good. Right. On the other side, are there modern artists who are interpreting modern music yes. on your Yes. So you lucked out. That was a good question. <laughs> so what's nice about yeah, pressure's off. There are there are contemporary musicians, um, composers that will actually take some of the village music, incorporate it into sort of a new style um, or interpretation to it. So yes, there is. And they're using the instruments too. These instruments, I'll, let me end with this. The instruments are not just popular in Armenian Middle Eastern music. You're hearing them in movies, movie soundtracks. May not be to the extent of what I'm playing, but you may hear a note. You may hear a couple of notes kind of thing. But there are, there are Armenian and Middle Eastern instruments that are conveying certain sounds uh, depending on the movie and Last Temptation or Christ is one that comes to mind, or uh, the Gladiator is another one, where a lot of this instrumentation is used in, in their soundtracks. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.